Okay, uh, Bob Reinerson is a manager of land department for uh, WM Beatty and Associates in Reading. Uh, he's been responsible for planned and implemented uh, reforestation and veg management projects on more than 50,000 acres of fire damaged land. An RPF, licensed pest control advisor, and a qualified applicator, and he currently is the chairman of the California Forest Pest Council. So with that, Bob, I'm going to turn it over to you. Are you on the line? Yeah, hi, Richard. Uh, good hi. morning, everyone. Uh, I'd like to thank Richard and Susie and the rest of those involved in putting this together. Uh, it's a very timely and important webinar series, and I'd like to thank you for inviting me to participate in it. And hopefully by reflecting on some of my experiences over the past 30 years, I can add some, something to this program. And uh, if, for those involved in wanting to plan or implement reforestation projects, um, I'm not going to go over the details of any one step. There's not time to do that, that uh, but I would like to uh, hopefully you'll come away with uh, some helpful ideas from our experiences. And this is my first time doing a webinar, so uh, be patient with me. And uh, okay. oh, Just a, a little background we, uh, of the experiences that we have. We manage land in uh, northeast California, several hundred thousand acres, and for those of you familiar with the area that aren't familiar with the area, the precipitation ranges anywhere from 14 to 15 inches per year on the east, far east side to up to 60 inches on our, our wetter areas on the, on the west side. And we deal mainly with uh, pine types, uh, east side pine, mixed conifer, and true fir with pine. Um, even at our, our highest elevation still had some pine in it because uh, it was all originally uh, bought uh, uh, by a, a person that the company was uh, interested in, in uh, managing the, the pine back when that was the only valuable species. So most of what we own was uh, even if it's turned into uh, white fur through fire suppression and whatnot uh, is capable of growing pine. But, uh, and one of the key things is uh, the Mediterranean climate of California that has a, a influence on uh, uh, management of forests, particularly reforestation. Uh, unlike most climates in the world, the uh, Mediterranean climate has, has uh, uh, a drought every summer, which means that uh, wa uh, water is a kind of the limiting factor for uh, the first year or two of seedling established, and it's a limiting factor further on for stocking and whatnot. But per particularly a limiting factor in getting your trees established. And also you've got uh, uh, dry lightning and wildfire, and you have a basically a fire season every summer and not just during a uh, drought like they do in other parts of the world in the U.S. So those are two key factors in uh, getting uh, reforestation uh, successful and then uh, maintaining your uh, planted forest. Um, yeah, I've had about 30 plus years of experience planting over about 50,000 acres uh, with over 13 million trees, uh, and it's been funded by private family landowners that are basically, uh, and most of it has been discretionary planting after wildfires uh, where they've uh, decided to, to basically invest in the next gen generation and their kids and their grandkids and their kids, and so uh, we've been very fortunate. We work for uh, some really uh, a good long-term landowners. Uh, and of those, of my experiences, uh, I'm, their reforestation projects have ranged from a half acre in size, uh, small fires, to up to several thousand acres. And the projects have ranged on uh, mostly uh, immediately after wildfire, but we've had uh, projects where there was a wildfire maybe 160 years ago, and it's been uh, a brush uh, since then. So it's a wide variety of time between the fire and the, and the planting, too. Um, and in this presentation, I'm, I'm using the term uh, reforestation on sites basically that have forest soils and were once likely forested, even if it was decades or centuries uh, ago, uh, so that the term, some people are, use the term afforestation if, if it currently doesn't have trees on it, uh, but um, I'm basically using, using that term, the term reforestation for it. So it's, um, 
you know, I've always thought of afforestation as mainly being planting trees on non-forest soils, such as the eucalyptus in the in the uh, Sacramento Valley or something like that. But, so anyway, you'll see that that term a reforestation when maybe afforestation should apply. We've also had a lot of experience with small landowners, uh, and those are primarily cost share types of projects, uh, CFIP, and then some carbon funded projects. Uh, I was involved with uh, uh, the uh, West Carb uh, Shasta County reforestation pilot projects, which was uh, looking at uh, the carbon sequestration benefits on small landowners. Uh, so uh, those are other types of projects we've dealt with that have their own unique set of circumstances. And then another uh, experience that I've been having recently is some volunteer work that uh, I've been doing with uh, Tom Jobson, who founded Cal Forest Nursery in Aetna. It's the largest uh, uh, tree conifer tree seedling nursery in California. Um, and he has been involved just volunteering his time over there uh, with helping them get uh, nurseries practices growing and up to speed. And then uh, he's got me involved with some of their uh, refor reforestation projects. Uh, they're just providing advice, and uh, it, even though it's halfway around the world, there's a lot of similarities to California because of this kind of the same Mediterranean climate. Uh, there's four kind of key things to think about is, is if you want a successful reforestation program uh, that's that's cost effective. Uh, one is to utilize a, a forester or RPF and a, a pest control advisor with reforestation and veg management experience, because uh, those are re really highly specialized. And I've been doing it 30 years, and I learn things every year, and I still stay involved in uh, keeping up to date on, on that. And those are, uh, especially with the veg management, that's a, a key component of any reforestation program. Um, and then also that another key is a timely completion of many sequential steps over multiple years. Uh, there's steps that occur and activities within those steps that are dependent upon the previous one being done. So unlike building a house where you get the foundation up and then uh, you might not get funded for a couple more years to, to build onto it more, when you, when you commit to a reforestation program, these steps have to be done and you can't delay one or switch them around and they have to be done in sequence and they have to be done on time. And so that's something that's important to remember up front uh, whenever you're putting together any kind of reforestation program. And then since what you're trying to do is uh, uh, get put trees into an environment, young seedlings into an environment uh, and transplant them, that once they get established, since they're native, you know, they'll do all right with very little help. But to get them established in the, again, in a Mediterranean climate where you've got uh, summer droughts that sometimes can go from May to November, uh, it is really key that you have quality control at every single step, and uh, we do that. You know, we don't uh, low bid out the contractors that are doing the work. Uh, we work with ones that really care about what they're doing and, and take pride in, in really doing a good job. And uh, so, uh, saving a few pennies uh, is going to end up uh, costing you a whole lot more. So that quality control, having somebody that's uh, experienced and qualified to oversee it, at the same time. Uh, have crews out there that are very experienced and uh, really love what they're doing is important. And then, and the fourth one is uh, the landowner's objectives must be clear and the decisions they make timely with funds available for all steps over multi-year frame. Uh, because again, you can't, uh, you don't want to wait till uh, after a fire for the landowners to uh, start discussing some key things that they could. Uh, and objectives that they have that they could have laid out earlier. Uh, they still might want to evaluate the plan you have, but uh, there are certain key things where you don't want to spend a year or two uh, trying to get them to all come together to make uh, a decision. Uh, you you need to act quickly, and that funding needs to be whether it be from public sources or private sources. They need to commit to a multi-year time frame. Uh, these steps for the. Uh, cost-effective and successful reforestation. John Helms did a really good job of going over these. I'm not going to really go over in detail, but it's, uh, you know, you want to use appropriate species and seed sources, and by appropriate species, you know, we use native species that are adapted to the site. Uh, and you, 
want to grow seedlings that are both easy to plant uh, and also able to withstand conditions on the site and able to grow roots rapidly. And that growing roots rapidly is really critical. Again, uh, we're, we're planting uh, where, you know, you can't afford to irrigate, set up irrigation for every tree. And so you want to plant into a site where they might not get rain for three or four months. So you want them to be able to grow roots fast. Then site prep, uh, there's three main uh, reasons for site prep. And so making any decisions on the activities that you would do uh, would be dependent upon these three main reasons. And now within this category of site prep, there can be several activities. Uh, you could have a site prep that will involve maybe uh, two chemical treatments and two or three mechanical treatments or just one site prep treatment that will simply be a real simple chemical treatment. Uh, but your goal for site prep is to control the competing vegetation uh, at least for the first year and, uh, and possibly the next two or three years uh, because you want all the uh, soil moisture that's available uh, for that young growing seedling to go to the seedling. Uh, most of what gets uh, taken out of the soil during these droughts is from uh, transpiration, not evaporation. So uh, it's, it's, uh, we've really learned that uh, by controlling the, the uh, com competition from uh, transpiring vegetation uh, that's competing with the seedling for the first year is, is really important. Uh, the other goal of site prep is to reduce the future fuel loading. And now this is something where uh, you really need to decide going up front because uh, if you don't control uh, the future fuel loading at the time of planting, it could get real expensive or you might not even be able to do it afterwards. Uh, so you've got to look ahead to, you know, what, what do you want your planted forest uh, growing amongst for the next 10, 15, 20, 100 years as far as, uh, especially in, in our climates uh, where things don't break down much and you can have these high fuel loads. And the other one is to provide access for planters. Um, and the old days, a lot of the site prep was really to provide access for planters. But with our the seedlings we use now, uh, that's not as much of a concern. There are some cases where we need to uh, uh, do clearing and uh, for uh, uh, to provide access, but uh, it's generally uh, uh, planters can kind of get in and plant in some pretty uh, sites with a lot of material in it uh, pretty easily or real rocky ground with the, the uh, seedlings we're using now. So the, 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 the key is controlling the competing vegetation. And then uh, trees are living, you know, when they come out of the nursery, they're living uh, things, and the more they transpire, or respire, uh, and the more their own food sources they use up before they hit the ground, uh, the weaker they're going to be. So they have to be properly handled, transported, stores, and stored and planted uh, up until the time of, of planting. Uh, and then, of course, uh, follow-up, uh, managing uh, competing vegetation uh, as far as competing for soil moisture and light, uh, but also managing future fuel loads is important. Uh, and then uh, managing uh, to minimize damage from uh, fire. And then uh, if you get a healthy trees that are diver you know, with diverse species and they're adapted to the site, the animals and insects aren't that big of a problem, but every now and then something will come up that you'll have to deal with. But, but the, the, the goal is to have healthy, vigorous trees that are adapted to the site and of a diverse species such that the, you don't have to deal with the animals and insects as much, but still look for them. Okay, Terry did a uh, really good job of going over the seed collection and all that. And basically what we do is we have the, uh, you want to use uh, quality seed that's not only good phenotypes, but also high quality seed that's mature. Uh, cones don't uh, mature too well after picking. So we like, we, we err on the side of letting the cones uh, ripen too much on the tree rather than try and pick them, get nervous and pick them too early. And so you want a good quality seed. And just like anything else, the better quality uh, it is and more mature it is from the seed stage, the better it's going to grow in the nursery and the better it will grow out in the woods and from good phenotypes. And then uh, they're categorized by the species elevation and seed zone. But we also 
uh, we'll try and mark on the, the collection the, the location of them in the year collected. There's times when uh, if we're if the highway is a seed zone boundary and we're on one side of the highway and we don't have seed from that zone and we've got a fire and we need to get the trees growing, if we know that they were collected uh, nearby, even if, if it was a different seed zone, or if, it, if knowing that location helps us determine whether that seed's suitable. So we like to put a location on ours and categorize them that way, uh, and then we uh, get them freezer stored. There's also seed from the North Sierra Tree, Tree Improvement Association, uh, Ponderosa Pine Seed. And basically, this is uh, utilizing a bunch of private owners and the state uh, as, as, as part of this. And this is seed from uh, uh, the best of the best that Mother Nature has to offer. And it's, it's not only a uh, tree improvement, but it's tree conservation. And a lot of the seed, the progeny has been tested to where uh, we see it as a a real good uh, strategy for for climate change or for for outplanting, where we know how different uh, seedlings will perform in these areas. But I believe this seed is also available. Uh, you know, the state has this seed because they're members of this co-op. And one of the questions is, you know, do you just directly seed or you grow seedlings? And we've We've learned that as far as conifers go, we grow seedlings in nurseries and then plant them. Uh, most of the oak management that we do, since uh, oak re-sprouts, we just manage the sprouts afterwards, and so we don't really uh, do much direct planting. But I've been involved in some uh, projects where we've planted oak on sites with, uh, where it had been kind of extirpated from. And uh, just this is my personal opinion. I think uh, as far as oaks go, you're better off uh, planting the acorns directly. But I'm going to focus more in this talk, though, on the actual uh, 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 growing in nursery and planting of uh, conifer seedlings in the woods. Well, the f first thing, one of the first steps, you contract with a nursery to grow your uh, quality seedlings. There's a couple of good nurseries in uh, uh, that can service California, uh, especially for interior California. Uh, we use primarily Cal Forest Nursery in Aetna. They've uh, been uh, great to work with for the past 30 years. And then there's a nursery, IFA Nurseries, in Klamath Falls. And so even though that's in Oregon, they, uh, uh, where they grow and, and their accessibility uh, fits California well. And three things you got to th uh, decide is what species and seed lots you want to use, the numbers of trees per acre. Uh, being that we, you know, knowing your acres, that'll give you the numbers of trees to order, and then the stock types. Uh, species, as far as species goes, you know one of the limiting factors is what what seed is available. What you don't want to do if you have a fire is wait for a seed crop. Uh, some seed crops on the east side, like Douglas fir occur you know maybe every five to ten years and even the pine takes that long and by that time um, you, you want to have seed ready to go so you've got to work with what's available uh, and then John Helms made a good uh, on his comments on using intolerant species we we favor the intolerance because our normal management is uh, single tree selection some group selection and with fire suppression we have uh, of plenty of white fir and cedar that seed in naturally, but it's the intolerant species uh, such as the Douglas fir and the uh, uh, ponderosa pine, Jeffrey pine, and sugar pine that uh, uh, do much better in an open, fresh burn and also uh, uh, the mix. But we'll, we'll also plant tolerant species, but uh, we, we favor the intolerance to make sure that they stay in the long-term mix. Uh, climate makes a difference of, of what your uh, the species you want to choose from. Uh, again, you might not know. It might be an old brush field, but knowing the climate and the soil type will help dis help you decide. Um, those and the soil type, the, the two key factors or three would be the available water holding capa capacity, texture, and depth. Uh, we've got some uh, projects where we've had these brush fields that were basically on a forest soil, a windy McCarthy type soil that's very, very light, sandy, very low water holding capacity, and uh, the forest really hasn't been able to grow back in them because of the manzanita. Uh, 
and then so when planting them back, even though sooner or later we want to mix conifer in there, the the best thing to use is ponderosa pine until you get something established. Uh, so soil type's important. Elevation aspect and topography uh, are all key things too. And uh, uh, some people will look at what was the stand look like before the fire, and we want to mimic that species mix, but you got to realize that uh, especially in interior California, what the stand you had prior to the fire might not be the most adapted uh, stand that was there pre-European settlement, that because of the early harvesting of pine and the uh, uh, decades of fire suppression, the, the, the mix that's there before the fire might not necessarily be the ideal mix. And so again, that's where we, uh, in our situation, favor a lot of the pine uh, and dug fir. And then the size of the burn uh, will make a difference in, in what we choose as far as the, uh, if, if it's a small burn, uh, 5 to 20, even 100 acres, and there's a good seed source of intolerant species around, uh, we can get some seeding in from, from there. Uh, and so uh, we, we might not plant as much white fir as, as we would if it was a really large fire where there's, there's no uh, seed source of white fur to, to come in. And this is just generally for us. Uh, our mixed conifer, uh, what, what I call low, isn't you know really low elevation, but it's low for our sites, which is 35, 4,500 or 5,000 feet. You know, we'll, we'll usually plant uh, pine, ponderosa, or Jeffrey or sugar pine, and Douglas fir, and then at the higher sites, we'll, uh, instead of the Douglas fir, we'll, we'll plant the red fir, white fir with, with the pine. And then uh, east side pine, those are the hard sites to get diversity on because, uh, but we try if there's, if Jeffrey pine fits, we'll uh, usually p plant some Jeffrey pine with the ponderosa pine. And then uh, on the low elevation west side of the, uh, the Cascades there, where it's, it's wetter, but you still have more of a ponderosa pine type forest, we're trying to put more and more uh, Douglas fir in there. It's it's tough to get going in interior California, but uh, once it gets established, it, it it seems to do pretty well. So the other question then is how many seedlings to order? Uh, common spacing used in California for uh, large trees. Uh, is ranges anywhere from 258 trees per acre to 436, depending upon, um, you know, whether it's uh, primarily pine or, or there's a lot of uh, fir in it. Uh, and then that's pre-commercially thinned at seven years to about 135 to 170 trees per acre. Uh, recently, we've been, uh, with the survival we've been getting, we've been planting initially lower uh, stocking levels uh, because we've get, gotten good survival and that reduces your cost later of uh, having to pre-commercial thin and also uh, even as, as important reduces the, the slash that, that results from that thinning. So we've been experimenting around with planting at 135 to 170 trees per acre. But again, it all depends on the site and the amount of uh, how uh, committed you are to, to making sure that each tree that's planted is, is, is successful. Here's just an example of uh, uh, a challenge experimental forest uh, down in the uh, a little further south of here in the, in the Sierras. Uh, they did some studies where they planted at various spacings 42 years ago. And it's always good to go look at what somebody did, especially on long-term uh, uh, forest. But uh, this is uh, 42 years after planting at six by six spacing. The average diameter is six and a half inches, and the stand's already breaking down and getting a lot of bugs in it, and uh, uh, the trees are very unhealthy, and I don't even think at this time they would release very well. Uh, then this is a, a more traditional planting, 12 by 12, but even these trees are starting to really crowd in and uh, uh, in need of thinning, uh, but uh, it could be an expensive thinning because they haven't really reached valuable saw log level. There and then this is the uh, where they were planted at 18 by 18, and and they're averaging instead of uh, 11 inches at the 12 by 12, they're averaging 16 inches, and that it's opened up enough. Even though uh, when I took this picture, I couldn't see a cedar anywhere within sight of a large cedar, 
uh, cedar is blown in and has, has seeded in there. So uh, again, when you're planting, you don't want to look, you want to have immediate targets of what you want as far as survival in there. But you're really, what you're, you're doing when you're creating a new forest, uh, you're looking 40, 50, 100 years down the road of what you want. So uh, keep that in mind when you're uh, figuring out your spacing. And this is a, just another example of how trees, uh, on the, especially in interior California, uh, 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 you know, compete with each other once they get to a certain size. And this is a, a tree that burned up in a fire and then got, uh, it wasn't quite large enough to make a saw log out of it, so it was uh, part of a biomass removal. But you can see for the first 15 years, these are five-year growth increments, the first first 15 years it was growing great, but then all of a sudden uh, it was starting to compete heavily with the other 299 trees per acre that were in there to where the point where it's getting close to shutting down. And so uh, you, you can't really wait till it's 15 years old to thin it because it's too big to, to, uh, to afford to just cut it and lop it up, but it's uh, too small to be able to pay its way out. So you want to be thinking ahead about what your forest looks like, you know, way down the road. Then the next is stock types, and we really look at two limiting factors. And one is the seasonal drought stress that I talked about before, and so we want to minimize the foliage height. We don't want a lot of foliage. Now, this doesn't apply to coastal California or the Pacific Northwest. They'll plant bigger trees because they're more concerned about light and not the the soil moisture, but we want uh, tr trees that aren't transpiring, uh, have a, a whole bunch of transpiring tissue, uh, but they still have to be hardy and so they can withstand sun scald. And you also want uh, uh, trees where, that can really grow roots well. So, so we're, we've been planting primarily uh, uh, con uh, container stock, small size for the pines, styro 5, maybe up to styro 6. And then for the dug fir and true firs, uh, styro six or eight. Uh, but uh, anyway, the key is what you want that tree to do is, the, especially the first year, you want it to put down roots and not get too stressed out uh, growing. Um, so then once you've made your contract with the nursery and uh, uh, got your sowing orders ready, you got to do it plenty ahead of time. Uh, because they'll need to stratify the seed. And again, this is planning for not planting the, the, uh, within three or four months. This is planning you do to plant a, a year or more away. They'll stratify the seed, then they'll sow it in the styro blocks in the nurseries in the spring, and then they'll grow it uh, during the summer. And this is a Cal Forest nursery, uh, and like I said, we also use uh, uh, IFA nurseries at Klamath Falls, which is a good nursery. Um, you notice the, let's see if I can work this, this, this black tarp here, this is something that uh, uh, we've been kind of working with the nurseries and they've developed, uh, oh, I think it was about 10 years or so ago, uh, to basically uh, create this blackout. Uh, it's not used on the pine, but for the uh, Douglas fir and I think for some of the other firs, it has been a really handy tool for uh, uh, our efforts to successfully plant more fir uh, with the pine on the drier, harsher sites in California. What it does is uh, you need to keep the dug fir from growing too big, uh, and in the past, in order to do that, they would basically uh, kind of starve them to death or uh, 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 withhold the water, and that would do the trick, but it would also make them weaker, whereas this blackout uh, technology done at the right time and at the right uh, point basically controls your top growth and, and sets the, the buds well. And so that's really helped out in the last several years with these nurseries doing this. Uh, considerations for mechanical site prep. Uh, again, I think uh, John Helms did a really good job on this. Uh, but you want to facilitate efficient and quality planting. And if you've got a big old brush field, uh, that you can't get through, well, that's obviously an uh, obstruction to planters. But after a burn 
and in a lot of cases they can get through and plant a lot of areas that have got a lot of material in it uh, with with the seedlings that we're growing so that's not as much of a concern in most cases as as it was in the past uh, but also uh, the mechanical site prep is a time when you can treat the fuel loading both of the green brush and the and primarily the dead fuels to lessen your future fire risk so again this is where you've got to be looking out many years uh, ahead and realizing that uh, the decisions you make at the time before you plant uh, can affect your ability to go later uh, treat these fuels and make it much harder. Um, then also it's used uh, to reduce habitat for rabbits and rodents that might damage tree seedlings. Uh, again, we haven't had that much of a problem. We don't really, uh, if we uh, plant good seedlings and we and we are watching things and can cover them we're not as much concerned but there are some cases where uh, you could uh, be creating a lot of rabbit habitat which then rabbits are really tough on uh, young seedlings so that's something to consider uh, and also use mechanical site prep to improve your soil characteristics or lessen erosion uh, control competing vegetation uh, that's really key uh, again as I said before um, but things to consider too is mechanical site prep can be very, very costly, uh, and and you really have to be careful that you. The one thing, you can uh, live with some mistakes, and say, well, maybe I should have planted a little bit more pine and a little less fir, or maybe I should have done a little bit more uh, fuel management. Uh, some of that stuff you can live with learning from, but what you don't want to do on a site is diminish the soil pro productivity because that takes century uh, eons to, to replenish. So you basically want to be really careful that you're not uh, diminishing the productivity of that topsoil. Uh, and then if mechanical site prep is used, it, it must be integrated with chemical site prep to not only make things a lot less costly, but also for environmentally uh, not doing, you know, to minimizing any kind of damage to the topsoil. Um, it, it's really important to integrate both of them. We've done some site prep, just strictly chemical and no mechanical, uh, but nowadays, uh, if you're going to do mechanical, you, you need to include the chemical. Uh, and here's just an example of uh, one site prep, a, a cat with a brush rake. Uh, 30, 40 years ago, when they cleared old brush fields and planted pine, they didn't have these brush rakes on them. They just basically scraped with the... Uh, the uh, blade there and they did a real good job of clearing the site and they got good survival because they scraped away a lot of the seed source so these pine plantations got going really well because there wasn't much competition but and they grew really well but after about 20 or 30 years starting to measure the growth growth on them they really starting to shut down because the topsoil was scraped away and so what's been added is these brush rakes to basically pull up the uh, brush for two reasons one to protect your topsoil but also to have a clean pile because if you have dirt in your pile and you try and burn it it can uh, smolder forever and uh, well not forever but it can smolder over a winter and pop up again the next year so the brush rake is critical if you're going to pile and another uh, thing that we've been doing in the past few years that really really helps is to pre-treat the brush if possible uh, with uh, chemicals so we kill the root systems of the brush and that way when you're mechanically clearing you don't have to pull the brush out of the ground uh, to to remove it and you don't even have to, to take out all of the top of it all you got to do is knock it down enough to meet your uh, objectives for fuel management and for uh, getting guys in there to be able to plant it so uh, that's that's a really good integration of, of two methods there is to uh, uh, use that uh, and for like after a fire after the, the saw logs have been harvested there's a lot of dead smaller material uh, and for again this is really we use this more as a fuel management and not so much uh, because a lot of these small dead trees uh, we can still plant through them and the trees can still survive that we plant if we control the competing vegetation around the tree uh, and uh, even on areas with real thick uh, submersible dead material that we've left, uh, 
10, 20 years after it falls down, you think it would crush all your trees, but it's it's amazing. The, uh, it, there's very little damage to the trees. The main problem with leaving this material, though, is uh, your fuel loading for down the road. And again, if you're in interior California um, that has a natural fire history of 10 to 15 years, uh, it's something to be concerned about. Uh, we've gotten really good at firefighting. I think uh, last I heard the success rate of putting out fires was 97 percent, which is, uh, uh, I'd love to have those grades in school, but the problem with that is the 3 percent that they can't put out are because the conditions are so bad and the fuels are so heavy that they're just monstrous fires that, that do a lot of damage. Um, so that's something to consider. Is uh, basically this process, is, as far as how much of this submergible material removed, the decisions we make are primarily for uh, fuel management purposes. Uh, and and again, if your neighbor is not doing anything after a fire, or just planting trees and then letting the brush go back and the dead material. Uh, stand there and then fall over uh, for years, then you, you need to do a much cleaner job of uh, cleaning your side uh, because the odds of a, f a fire uh, not getting into this area over the next 50, 60, 80 years is very, very low. Uh, then another mechanical uh, treatment is ripping or subsoiling. This is something we used to do almost as standard on slopes less than 30 percent that weren't rocky. Uh, we're doing less and less of this uh, because of a lot of the what we've noticed and, and some of the long-term uh, research on uh, heavily, where they've actually artificially heavily compacted soils is showing that uh, the sandier soils, it really doesn't do anything to improve growth. Uh, but where you have loam or clay soils uh, that are compacted, if they happen to be compacted, this is your one chance to uh, do anything about it. Because once you get trees in the ground, you really can't do this. Um, so uh, the, the ripping is used to improve the soil structure. But it's also used to facilitate uh, water infiltration into the soil. And then it's also uh, very good if if you have a concern about the, if there's a problem with the surface runoff and resulting topsoil erosion, uh, ripping on contour is a really good way of reducing that. Uh, and actually, I think there's a fairly recent, I mean, this is observational, but there's been a, a recent study on that where they actually were able to get in with all the timing of a fire and, and do some, uh, uh, put set in some plots. And it's, it's really kind of showing what what we've all kind of observed to be be true that it's a good way to reduce your uh, your runoff. Um, and in the old days too, when we planted bare root stock with shovels or wide bladed hoedads, uh, this uh, this ripping would really help. Um, but it is getting very very costly, and you've got fixed costs if you have a small 10, 20, even 50 acre uh, fire. Just the move in and move out cost of that cat, that fixed cost, can really add to your per acre cost. And sometimes, with all the other things going on, it can be a scheduling concern. Uh, and then, where you have slope, rock, or stumps, it's it's uh, it's not really doable. And as I said before, it's not really necessary on sandy to sandy loam soils if your your goal is to uh, improve the growth as, of the tree and the soil structure. And there's some other types of, of mechanical site prep. This is a, we've done this a few times uh, with some small landowners. Basically, it's mastication. Uh, almost every brush species in California will re-sprout after cut or a burn. However, white leaf manzanita does not, and this was a white leaf manzanita uh, unit on a, a site that uh, had been probably burnt a few times and was uh, fairly eroded. So there was real concerns about the, this, these soils here. They were already eroded uh, of using a cat to clear it down to, to dirt. So uh, we came in with a, um, uh, a, uh, a masticator. Uh, the disadvantage, of the, and it worked really well, uh, except for the disadvantages. You, you do have a fuel loading. It's not a fuel loading as far as flame heights and lengths that is a concern. It's more fuel loading that for the next several years these trees could be susceptible to, to burning up because of it. Uh, but it really protected the soil well. Uh, 
You'll notice in, the, in this uh, right-hand corner, though, even with the, the mulching effect of the mastication, we still had grasses coming up. Uh, and especially the European annual grasses, they're really efficient at sucking the, all the moisture out of the soil down below the depth that these trees can root in. And so we still needed to treat this uh, grass here this first year to get a successful uh, establishment. Uh, here's an example of where it's just chemical without mechanical. Uh, we have, um, you know, rock, real rocky soil, kind of low brush, and rather than get in here and disturb all that soil, and, and it had been real costly, plus it would have been uh, very, a lot of soil disturbance with the rock in there, uh, having that uh, nice container stock, uh, it's, it was no problem to plant, These, and we've got some nice dead uh, mulch shade, and these trees are, are doing really well. Um, after, another site prep thing is after a fire, if you've got existing brush in there, above ground, this doesn't look like a whole lot, but below ground, this, there's, this is all re-sprouting chinkapin, and you're going to have a, a, a real problem with this if you wait to treat it after, until after you plant, so it's something now that there's some real safe and uh, effective chemicals that you can use to actually treat this to uh, uh, to kill the the, the uh, root systems, and that way when your trees grow on the ground, they're not competing with a mature root system that will uh, overtop them really quickly. Uh, here's an example where uh, years ago we, we planted in and we didn't really fully treat the brush and uh, it came back and basically just buried the trees and, and to the point of after 20 years later there was very few trees per acre and they were very weak, poor, vigor shape, uh, susceptible to pine reproduction weevil. And so uh, we had to go in and clear it. So again, immediately after a fire is the time to do all the treatments and think about you know what you want down the road. Uh, and it was very expensive to clear this uh, uh, at this time. And you could see, even with the piling we did with the brush rake, uh, there's still, in a couple of chemical treatments, there's still brush there and growing in there. So you, the goal isn't to get rid of the brush completely. The goal is just to manage it to meet your objectives of getting your young seedlings established and on their way. Uh, another example of... Uh, you know, the, the importance of controlling your competing vegetation. These sites were both planted uh, after a fire on the left. Uh, there was no control of the uh, competing vegetation. On the right, uh, there was. And um, this here, this these trees in here are pretty close to where this is here. Um, uh, and this is uh, another example of project where we uh, besides treating resprouting brush you need to treat uh, uh, the, the uh, grasses and forbs that are going to be coming in around your seedlings and here we had a, a spray buffer area where we didn't get in and, and do uh, the, the circle spraying around the trees and, t and uh, ended up with basically 95 percent survival on the project but the five percent that didn't survive was all within these buffer zones. And this is a, uh, it's a pretty marginal site here, very shallow soils. It was an old area where uh, the smelting fumes had wiped out a bunch of trees in the uh, early 1900s. And uh, uh, it came back to Manzanita. And uh, so uh, the soils were fairly eroded. But even on those really harsh sites, if you allow your healthy, young, vigorous seedling access to all of the, the resources within its rooting area, uh, especially soil moisture, get some pretty healthy seedlings. And this is how we judge the health of a seedling, length of needle, color of the, the needles, and having a nice bud set uh, there. Again, we're not looking for huge top growth. We're looking for a healthy uh, seedling that will get its roots established and then in the next couple of years do well. Areas within the uh, buffers, we will do circle sprays with a, a, a chemical that doesn't move once it hits the soil. And that's uh, very, very safe. And again, that's how we get survival in there. Uh, this 
is an example of um, where uh, we've planted uh, various projects. And one thing is you, you, you can't just go on what's the average precipitation in your area and, oh, well, we didn't, you know, we had a drought year, so that's the reason our trees died. Um, if you control the competing vegetation and plant good quality seedlings and, and do everything else right, even in years with really low uh, uh, summer, spring, and summer moisture, you can still get uh, good survival. Uh, and this, uh, tr it's, it's amazing how similar uh, half, half the world away uh, uh, these principles still still work. This is some uh, uh, one of the more harsher sites that we were working with guys in Lebanon on, and uh, um, uh, this is, uh, you can see the Lebanon, we're looking to the west, and the Mediterranean Sea is over this way, and so we're in the kind of the far eastern uh, Lebanon here. There was a planted forest, so it does show that these soils uh, can sustain a really good native forest, and so this was a test site. And uh, I see my time is getting up here, so I'm just going to go through this real quick. But it basically showed kind of the same principles with, with good seedlings, um, uh, these test areas uh, show this is about halfway through the growing season. This is where uh, vegetation was controlled, where it wasn't. You just see the health of the seedling is so much different. And then the final results, uh, basically 93% of the seedlings were veg controlled, vegetation was controlled, had good vigor, uh, whereas where no vegetation was controlled, uh, only 8% had good vigor and 74% were dead. And again, some examples of the trees that were in the veg control areas versus this is actually the best tree out there, and then this was pretty typical of the non. And really what we do a lot more, it's, it's easy for foresters and others just to look at what's above ground, but you really got to look at below ground and the roots. And uh, so digging, we, we plant extra seedlings that we can dig up just to, to check the roots. Um, and the root growth here, we had uh, seedlings that uh, went down 30 centimeters below the soil surface, and there was still moisture at 20 centimeters in, in this veg control plot, whereas other areas, um, where there was no veg control, the, it was dried out because of the transpiration of the weeds to where it, uh, it went below what, where the, the roots could grow. Again, this is critical. The first few years, once these trees get established and they're native trees, uh, they shouldn't have any problem. And then just your control of your brush and whatnot is just more from a fuel management point of view. Uh, example of oaks re-sprouting after a fire, if these weren't treated, we would just be buried in the oaks. Uh, we don't want to get rid of them all, but we want to manage them so they're part of a mixed conifer forest and not a, a conversion to oak. Uh, this is a, you know, a fountain fire. Again, this was uh, planted in, uh, uh, and the oaks were controlled here, probably more so than, than we would. We would leave a few more. But here, there were, the oaks were not controlled, and, and that's all you've got now. Um, here's some of our oak management. This when we we do leave, the oaks that we leave, uh, we like to when we go do our pre-commercial thinning, thin out to one to two stems, and that uh, hopefully gets them producing acorns a little bit quicker. But it also uh, this ponderosa pine here, if we hadn't thinned that oak out, it would have just way overtopped it. So. Um, Then once your seedlings are uh, uh, they're out of the nursery, uh, you've done all your site prep, uh, you got a quality control while they're packed, stored, uh, and then cold stored until the time you plant them. Uh, and again, quality crews. You want you, you want people out there. You know these crews we use. The guys have been planting for several years and very, you know, they're well paid and we go for that more than the, the low bid. Uh, then micrositing the fir is trying to get it in natural shaded spots. Pine could be planted in the, the open and it does just fine. You can tell by the size of the buds and the needles and all. 
and then you want to check for the root growth. Again, the, you're looking to make sure your seedlings are healthy on top, but this is really what you want to, what you want to look for. A few weeks after planting, you want to see these roots going down uh, to where they can get down to permanent moisture. Uh, this is a seedling, you know, container seedling a, a year after uh, the, the first growing season after planting. And again, this is what we probably lost some of the roots in digging it up, but this is what you're looking for, these roots that go way down to the permanent soil moisture and lots of them. Uh, this is two years later, what it, what it looks like. And again, after a couple of years, if you've done a good job and, and really focused the first few years, then it makes things a lot easier uh, down the road. Uh, and sometimes you, you know, you should still should uh, keep an eye on your your planted forest, but not uh, you don't have to do as much to it. Uh, again, these are general planting dates, and uh, we we do. Uh, and when I say low, high, and mid elevation, that's kind of in relation to to our management area. We don't have much over 6,500 feet. Uh, so kind of start. On the west side, we uh, we might start a little bit earlier because the snow melts a little bit earlier than the east side. But basically, soon after snow melt, when the soil temperatures warm up, we start our spring planting. But you want your soil temperatures uh, up to where the roots can start growing. Uh, we've been doing a lot of some fall planting lately, and it can be very effective because the disadvantage of spring planting is you can have 20 miles through timber of snow like this, and your site might be open uh, where it's cleared in a burn. And uh, you can uh, so fall planting. There's advantages. Uh, you get an earlier start. The disadvantages in fall planting. Oh well, this is, and and what you do is you get a start. This is some fall planting um, where we planted Octo uh, October 5th and then dug them up October 26th, and you see they were already initiating root growth. However, where we waited till just another week, uh, they were already, you know, the soils were getting too cold to really get root growth going. So most of your root growth in our fall plant, at least in our east side high elevation, needs to get planted by the first week in October. However, we'll plant all the way into early November because even if we don't get that root growth, as long as we get a good snowpack on top of those trees, we get... Uh, uh, they do really well, and they store really well. And then that the following spring, they actually get an earlier start than our spring planted trees. Disadvantages, though, of fall plant and where the, where it's risky is there's a lot more coordination and scheduling uh, with the nursery and your planting crews because you're basically hot planting instead of pulling all your trees out, storing them till they're ready, the site's ready. Uh, once you lift the trees for fall planting, you've got a week to plant them, and you've got to plant them. You can't lift them. In the in the in the early fall, and then expect to store them. Uh, so there's a lot more scheduling involved, and for us, especially on the east side, uh, we many times the first uh, uh, precipitation we'll get uh, will be snow in late October, early November. Uh, so that makes it a little difficult. Uh, and also, uh, we'll get some really low relative humidities uh, on the east side, even in the fall and winter, which can uh, exacerbate uh, transplanted stock and stress on seedlings unless there's a pack of snow on it. Uh, so those are some of the concerns we have uh, about fall planting and some of the risks, but we have been doing it just to avoid the, the, uh, the mess of trying to wait until spring to get it planted, but those are some of your considerations. Uh, what has helped us in our fall planting is this is a, a site where uh, we uh, had planned to plant we we'll hope to plant in fall, heavy snowfall area, but uh, there was no rain here up through October 22nd. The reason we were able to plant is because we basically treated uh, all the competing vegetation uh, that spring or, or the fall before such that this site uh, was basically fallow and had no transpiration on it. And uh, again, since the only thing was evaporation, we had soil moisture at four inches, so we were able to actually fall plant without getting any fall rains. And these trees did really well. We got a nice snowstorm and rain right after this. Um, again, the release spray, uh, when when it gets trees are this well established, uh, you'll get more growth out of them by spraying. But even if, if the growth isn't that big of an issue for you, uh, you've got to look ahead 
five, ten years to fuel management problems and whether or not you want uh, the, the brush to start overtaking these trees from that, that point of view. Um, this is an area uh, in a buffer where we basically just circle sprayed to get the uh, trees established, didn't do any removal of the dead wood or uh, uh, the broadcast of the brush. Uh, it kind of met that objective. Our only concern is um, the fuel hazard here because we basically, you know, it would be very expensive to come in here and treat the fuels now. Uh, but we wouldn't want this on the entire thousand acre project but within uh, just a small percentage of it you know we can it, we can live with this I guess but anyway um, I see my time I think is up Richard true enough true enough it's up okay well um, I have a couple questions I surely like to take the time to address those okay I'll go to you the, just have a couple more slides actually right? I just got a couple more if uh, people this is uh, where the the spraying of the brush was delayed a year or two because of uh, economic situation, and also I was thinking at the time that well it's not too bad, but uh, it it did get pretty bad, and so if you delay it, it's going to cost more because you you can do it, you can protect the trees and treat the brush, but it just it, and you're using a lot more chemical. The, the goal is to use as little chemical as possible at the least amount of cost early in the in the game to where uh, uh, you're uh, using the little little amount of chemical and the least amount of cost but still meet your objectives this is a site where uh, in the moonlight fire most of the moonlight fire per, pretty uh, drastic we had a plantation where we did uh, manage the dead fuels and the brush and we actually had just thinned this stand and so we had some dead trees in there but the fire went through killed maybe 20 percent of the the trees but it basically most of the plantation survived and we've come in and interplanted dug fir and uh, in the in the holes there but again this is 12 years later you know your the fuel management uh, concern you can see also too where the cedar had seeded in after about 10 years and there's not a cedar tree for several hundred yards from here but the cedar tree obviously didn't survive the fire and here's looking at it from the air uh, this was the original fire boundary in here in uh, the mid and late 1990s it got replanted our neighbors at that time did a really good job of uh, fuel management and replanting then when the moonlight fire came through uh, you could kind of see the the trees that survived uh, some areas like a, in where the watercourse buffers and whatnot where we uh, uh, didn't do uh, the the fuel management and uh, didn't treat the brushes as much uh, didn't survive as well and then there's a unit about a mile or a half mile south of here that we did not keep up on the brush control and most of that did burn up uh, as well as there was a nice residual green stand from the even the first fire in there that uh, we were hoping to save, but uh, I think had we done more fuel management in there, that we might have saved that, but that burned up too. And that's it, Richard. Sorry for running over. You only run over by a few minutes. I mean, I took up some of your time. Um, and, you know, I, this information is so good that I, I think uh, uh, we didn't lose even one participant. So uh, I would not... Uh, I would not question the time right now. Okay. Uh, there's a bunch of questions, though, and that, <laughs> that might take more time than anything. Um, um, Joe, let me, me just to... read the questions to you, and then you can address them, okay? Okay. So John's asking about uh, the benefits to planting seedlings in late fall, and I think he covered that. Yeah, he might have uh, that before I covered it, and I unfortunately yeah. probably covered it too quick. If you can uh, and still uh, get it and coordinate with the nursery, uh, I wouldn't do it at the lower elevations, but certainly at the higher elevations, uh, it, it it would work. Yeah, he he asked it before you uh, covered that, but he he might want to follow up with you. Your email address is up there on on the top. John is uh, as I I believe he's got uh, a burned area that, or maybe he don't. I'm not sure exactly where he's from. Okay. Um, but anyway, maybe he could follow up with you if he needs to. Uh, Dave, uh, Pastor Roy has got some questions about uh, 
the ideal state around the gr of the ground around the seedling. I think you also covered that a little bit, but um, well, I, I, I see it. I can probably answer them pretty quick here. What's the ideal state yeah. around uh, around the seedling? Uh, the ideal, or actually the target state, and again, uh, when you're looking above ground, what we're concerned with as far as the soil moisture is below ground. So depending upon how the roots of the adjacent uh, uh, competing vegetation uh, come in, you you want uh, you basically want it clean. Tw if there's 25% cover around your trees, we've had situations where I've looked and said, well, that's not too bad. There's only 10% cover around the tree, but they that cover has been able to dry that ground out to the point of either creating a real uh, uh, unhealthy seedling that's got short needles and and uh, uh, not really a good bud or dead. Uh, so you want uh, and there's rules of thumbs, but you really need to look at, at at what's going on in the ground there. If it's just grasses and forbs, you want to have them at least uh, probably a meter and a half away from your tree so that their roots aren't. Uh, you know, getting in. If it's a, a established brush, maybe more. As far as fuels go, uh, you know, that's that's a, you know that to me that's a, something that uh, we're still learning. Uh, but 25% uh, cover by 10-hour fuel. Yeah, I, that that's something that we're we're still working on. I, like I say, it depends on the fire and the fire in this picture where it says questions uh, you know we our clients had you know entrusted me with a million dollars to get their 3,000 acres reforested to look like this and this chips fire was burning all around it and uh, at the time I was thinking man I wish I would have done more a little more thorough job on the, the cover it just depends on the fire but uh, it's 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 really something that needs to be thought about but as far as the for the few, the moisture loss to the weeds it is transpiration. Evaporation uh, isn't that big of a deal, although if you do have uh, mulch over it, again, that's where spraying versus clearing the, to bare dirt uh, and leaving the dead, dead mulch uh, can help a little bit. But it's really the transpiration that gets to the rooting level. The evaporation gets more on the surface. Uh, There's a, let's just, uh, we better wrap it up, but uh, Craig's asking about why planting pine, and uh, pine has not always been low value, so well, we don't I, really know where it's going to be 50 years from yeah, now. Yeah, to answer that, it's, it, it's, uh, if the ground's suitable for it, and I don't know if it's a, if you build it, they will come kind of thing, but, and also the markets, uh, there was a situation like 20 years ago when cedar was almost worthless, and we had a brush field with little cedar underneath it, that we probably could have just released the cedar for a very cheap cost, uh, but because cedar was so valueless and, and the other species were more at the time, this was a long time ago, we ended up spending a lot more to pile it and then replant other species. And looking back at the price of cedar now, I'm going, boy. But I, I think you want to plant it to have a variety. And that's another reason for having a variety of species. Not only is your forest healthier with a variety of species, because most pests are specific to a, a specific uh, tree species, but also you have a variety of timber values. But he, he brings up a good point: is that you know if you're investing in this, uh, landowners that invest in this to me are, are are very very admirable, and and when they entrust me with their money to do that, uh, you know that's you know I think it should be taken really really seriously. We better wrap it up, Bob. Uh, thanks so much. If there's a couple other questions, we might forward them on to you uh, later on. Um, 